And on tonight's edition of Mind Your Business, I'm going to be co-hosted alongside Mike McIntyre, head of business banking sales at Citizens, and we're going to be joined by a great panel, Mark Williams, head of business banking treasury solutions at Citizens, Kate Conroy, senior vice president, enterprise payment strategy and innovation at Citizens. We're also going to be joined by Thomas Gretsch, president and CEO at the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. John Harmon, founder, president, and CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. And we're also going to be joined by Abe Schlisselfeld, Senior Managing Director at CBiz Marks Panath. Welcome back to another edition of Mind Your Business right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York and around the world on the powerful iHeart Radio Network. I am thrilled and delighted to be co-hosted once again by a friend and a, uh, a senior executive at Citizens, Mike McIntyre. Again, thank you for joining me here on the set. It's been a while. It's been a little bit too long, actually. It's, like, it's great to be back on it. It has been a while, but uh, I am so happy to be back here. Good to see you again. All right. Uh, a little bit just as far as our intro. By the way, I just checked the stats. Nielsen, the Nielsen ratings have us once again in the top 10 in New York AM radio. We came in actually number three. That's pretty cool. It, it, factoring in, there's a lot of sports going on on Sunday night. Coming in number three. Is a, is a testament to the great guests that we have each week, the great content we share, and you, every single listener. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for the feedback you give me all the time. And tonight's show brought to you in part by Citizens. Citizens is one of the nation's oldest and largest financial institutions with uh, assets of $223 billion. That's as of 6-30-23. That's the last quarter uh, from when we're recording the show. Headquartered in Providence, Rhode Island, Citizens offers a broad range of retail and commercial banking products and services to individuals, small businesses, middle market companies, large corporations, and institutions. They have a tremendous presence here in the Northeast on tonight's show. We will discuss the rising interest rates and the impact that it has on small businesses, how businesses are surviving and adapting, the role of digital payments, processing and invoicing. What about a lending update in the rising rate environment? Mike, quite it's a, been too quite long. A, quite a roster for yes. our show together in a long yes. time. Um, let's just jump right in. You know, well, yeah, a, a lot's happened in the, in the last two years. Uh, Citizens has has stepped into the New York market in a very big way. They've also acquired historically the, the retail branches of the former HSBC on the East Coast. Which essentially puts us in the in the top ten here on the East Coast, a uh, diversified bank with almost eleven hundred branches uh, across the country. So, uh, great organization, uh, growing in a, in a very meaningful way here in the Metro New York market where whistles are tonight. And uh, we have a very long uh, tradition of being in this space uh, historically, and uh, it's been a great run. And I'm very excited to see what the future holds. Amazing. Now, uh, if I'm going to turn to Mark Williams, Mark, welcome to Mind Your Business. Hey, it's like, welcome uh, to you, sir, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Amazing. Now, there's been tremendous changes in the payments and cash management space, impacting every type of small business owner. Can you give us uh, kind of the state of the current uh, technologies available to small businesses and you know, all types of covering the range of consumers that citizens services? Yeah, I'm happy to. Right now, look, I think the, the, the pace of change in the payments uh, uh, arena has been uh, almost staggering, especially for small businesses in the in the recent past. I think COVID accelerated it quite a bit. The good news is it's become much simpler for small businesses that like they're it's easier for them now to accept payments and, and manage cash. Now, the difficulty, I think, sometimes is there's so many options and so much competition um, and different straight up different payment options out there, just different types of payments, that it can be hard for a small business owner to really understand where um, payments fit into their ecosystem, into their customer's buying process. And that's really kind of where um, research comes in handy. And, and honestly, radio shows like this, really getting some advice from some people that, that are kind of embedded in the industry. So a few things that have really changed, I think have really grown rapidly. So just think about peer to peer payments, right? So things like Venmo, um, Cash App, uh, PayPal, et cetera, those have grown 
significantly in the last few years. Uh, real-time payments, which is something that didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago, right. um, as well as same-day ACH. Like these are just like just a few of exa- examples of things that have changed. And right there, there are three wildly different kind of uh, modes of, of of accepting payments. So. Uh, I hope that answers your question, sir. Yes. Yes. So this question, I'm also going to turn to Kate Conroy along with you, uh, Mark. Uh, It seems that mobile payments are extremely common these days, right? Just whip out the smartphone and, all right, I just want to do my banking. Can you please talk about the array of services that Citizens offers just from the convenience of a smartphone? Yes, of course. Um, So so as you said, uh, business on the go is more important now than ever. I think covid and the pandemic really showed us as a society how important it is to be able to continue things digitally and on the go. So mobile is more important than ever. And banks like citizens, as well as a lot of fintech providers out there um, are also recognizing that in, in the sense of having a mobile first strategy. Citizens has a mobile first strategy. We put everything in mobile, then we try to have our web version um, have the same functionality, but we start with mobile because that's where most of our customers are are doing their banking and doing, and they're out on the go. So they don't have time to be in front of a computer doing stuff, um, especially their banking. So it should be easy. It should be accessible. Um, so that's very much a strategy for citizens as, as well as many banks and fintech providers out there. And it's like one thing I would I would add. So when you think about the the first question you asked around the changes in the payments landscape, and then you add in mobile, look, things have transformed rapidly, right? But the bottom line, no matter what changes, to me, what's most important to small business owners is how all of this can impact their cash flow. Uh, any one of the listeners that are, are that are entrepreneurs that own a business, they know that they they live and breathe what's coming in and what's going out in terms of, of, of cash. So all of these services at the end of the day are designed to really help empower a small business owner to get a hold of cash flow. Hey, Mark, there, there are so many terms out there these days when it comes to mobile and digital and, and how a business owner can can manage their business. Can, can you articulate, can you speak about what, what point of sale means to your average business customer? And then how does that dovetail into things like merchant services, accepting online payments or website payments? And then how does that do, then lead into things like invoicing and the technologies that are available to support that? Those are great questions, Mike. And you know, it's actually interesting is, is we were having a discussion earlier in the week about point of sale because what the term means has kind of changed over time. So when you go to people that have been in the industry for a long, long time in the payments and merchant industry for a long time, that they will tell you that point of sale is really a system inside of a retail or restaurant where the customer is facing um, the business owner or whoever is processing the payment, where I tend to view it more as any means by which the point of a customer transfers revenue or transfers a payment to a small business owner. It really depends on, on who you, who you, uh, who you talk to. So I think in one term point of sale really means your system by which you manage revenue or payments in from your, um, uh, customers, whoever your customers are, if they're business to business, if it's business to consumer, it, it doesn't matter. It's really how payments come into your um, business. And what point of sale system you have can really matter and can really impact how you manage um, not just your cash flow, but also these days it's like inventory and and ordering. All, all kinds of things can be done through your uh, POS, CRM, or or um, sort of what we would call enterprise resource platform. So it really depends on on the type of business, but that's kind of a very generic term, Mike. I don't mean to like to, to keep it so high level, but I hope that that helps you. Now, invoicing is something, it's one of the biggest innovative changes over the last, say, five to seven years um, that is pushed down from corporates, right? That's typically how these things go. You'll get a technology, get adopted in corporates, and then it becomes cheaper and easier for banks and financial firms to deploy to smaller and smaller customers, and they'll be able to take the opportunity as well. So invoicing is one of those um, really key things because it, it can massively accelerate your uh, time to revenue, honestly, because if you send a, think about this, if you send a, an invoice in the mail 
Well, it takes the time from the mail. It takes time for the customer to pay it. It's a piece of paper. They might put it in a stack where if you send them an SMS or an email, typically what are they going to do? Well, if they've got their phone right in front of them and that's where they're reading the, the, the email or the SMS, chances are they're going to click pay and then then they're going to have an option to typically pay either by your credit card or ACH. So it's a it's a really great way to speed collection, um, which we all know is is one half of the of the equation when you're trying to really maximize um, your cash flow and liquidity, Mike. Does that, that help? Yeah, Mark, it's a great it's a great response. And I want to build on that. And Kate, I'm going to turn to you for this next part of that question, right? So you're building on your cash flows. Can you talk about what positive pay means? And then, you know, Mark, after, after Kate kind of covers that thought, I'd love to get your thoughts about, you know, fraud mitigation. Because obviously with all these digital technologies out there, you know, there's, there's different things to be aware of. So Kate, how about you just talk a little bit about positive pay for us? Sure, of course. Um, so first, I like to start with statistics. Um, so according to the 2022 AFP fraud survey, 63% of respondents reported that the organization faced fraud activity via checks. And of those who were victims of payments fraud, almost three quarters of them were not able to recover the funds they lost. So it is very much, especially check fraud, is very much something that should be on every business owner's mind because it, just because it hasn't happened in the past, it does not mean you are safe. It does not mean it will not happen. It is rampant. It is prevalent. So it should be high on, on everyone's mind. Um, positive pay. So positive pay is a, is a service that banks offer that help businesses mitigate their risk of check fraud. So what it logistically is, is every time a business issues a check, every time you write a check, that goes out to whoever you're paying in the mail or in, you know, hand it to them in person, the business would then send a record of that check to the bank and say, bank, I just wrote check number one, two, three to so-and-so for $50. And now that issue record is what it's called. The bank has that data. So, so later, three days later, a week later, two months later, when that check comes in to actually post to that account, the person that wrote the check, we will compare the check data that we have come in and see if that matches anything that our customer gave to us in the form of an issue record. So if we see that there's no check that matches, maybe we see check one, two, three for so-and-so, but instead of $50, it says $53 or $500 or the amount's different or something, or the check isn't in our records at all, we then call attention to that. We, on our online banking platform, we would let the customer know this is a suspect, a suspect check. Can you please look at it and tell us if this is something you want to pay or return? And the whole service is really centered around check processing rules. So in the U.S., che with check clearing, every bank has the ability to return a check to the bank that sent it to them because in order to, and sometimes it's the same bank, but um in order to collect funds for a check, the bank that it was deposited into sends it to the bank that issued the check. So check rules require that if the bank that receives the check has 24 hours to return it, no questions asked. It doesn't have to be a fraud case, no fraud investigation. You can just return a check that first day that you receive it. So that's where positive pay is just based around those rules because as long as we are flagging it for a customer and they tell us, "Ooh, I didn't write that check, or I don't know if I wrote that. That looks like it was, it was, it was um, changed. The amount was changed, or someone retouched something on the check. We'll just return it, no questions asked. The funds get credited right back to our customer's account, and end of story. So that was that. In that case, there was no check fraud. It was caught immediately. There's no fraud investigation. So it's important to understand that because." Positive pay comes in if you're issuing a lot of checks, because if you have 200 checks posting to your account every day, it's very difficult to keep track of, did I write these 200 checks? Let me look at my Excel spreadsheet and go one by one. It's a lot of work to do that for 200 checks. So that's where positive pay comes in because the bank is keeping track of that for you and doing that matching ahead of time. Saves, saves the customer time. However, if you're, a, if you're a business owner that is issuing maybe 10 checks a month and you don't have that kind of volume and it is something that you can just watch yourself, you don't need positive pay. You just need to do the same process, which means you would be looking every morning at checks that posted to your account last night, make sure you wrote those 
And if you did not write the check or if something was changed and you do not want it posting to your account, you just call the bank, make sure you call earlier in the day. I would try to call before 2 p.m. and to just get ahead of any processing time. Call the bank and say, I did not write this check, please return it, whatever reason, and the bank will return it. You don't need to open up a fraud case, your account doesn't get frozen, it's just within that 24 hour window still. So you can just return it on your own. You don't need to subscribe to Positive Pay. Positive Pay comes in when you have a lot of volume and it's hard to keep up with the volume, but if you have a low volume, every business owner should be doing that and trying to take advantage of that window because if you wait till the second day, now we've missed the window and now it's a fraud investigation and it's a lot more painful. So it's very important to look at your account every morning, inspect the activity and call your bank immediately if you see something that looks suspicious. Mark, any other thoughts on fraud mitigation? Yeah, actually quite a bit. So a few things to know, Mike, like the, the first thing about fraud is it, it's prevalent and it's been growing. Um, significantly, especially uh, since, say, 2017, 2018, the vast majority of customers are going to experience at least attempted fraud. Um, so I would say the first thing to do, look, if you're not writing a lot of checks, as Kate pointed out, is how do you mitigate the use of your checks? How do you reduce using checks? Well, you can do ACH, you can do real-time payments, um, or you could even, if you're a disciplined uh, uh, business owner, I, I would recommend it a credit card, right? Putting things on a, on a commercial card or a small business card can be a fantastic vehicle. You've got to pay it in full though every month. I mean, you don't have to, but I recommend it. I always do um, when I'm giving advice, pay it in full every month. But what you do when you when you do that is one, you reduce the, the, the incidence of paper checks, which are by far the easiest um, uh, vehicle for fraud. So on average, um, um, they're double, they're, they're more than double the risk of, of any other form of payment. Um, uh, uh, checks are just because they're easier to wash, collect, et cetera, and, and to sort of plagiarize. But a credit card will allow you to do a couple of things. One, it'll allow you to control your spending and you can see, um, everything in one place Two, if it's a full blown commercial card, you can, you can actually control where the spending is happening. So you can actually restrict according to something called a merchant classification code or MCC code, you can restrict where customers or where, excuse me, where cardholders can make payments. So if you've got a few people on your staff, one person orders office supplies and, and one person does travel and entertainment, well, you can restrict the office supplies person to only office supply um, merchant classification codes. So it, it can be a really handy tool to control spending, but it also gives you probably most importantly, an additional anywhere from 20 to 30 days of float, if you will, right? It gives you the billing cycle of the card. So if you're paying your vendors on net 30, you pay them on day 28, 29, day 30 on a card, and then you get an additional 30 days with your working capital. So it could be one, a great fraud mitigation tool, and two, a great working capital um, optimization tool, Mike. I'm joined on the set by Mike McIntyre, head of business banking sales expansion markets at Citizens. And we're speaking with Kate Conroy, Senior Vice President, Enterprise Payment Strategy and Innovation at Citizens, and Mark Williams, Head of Business Banking Treasury Solutions. Now, just a, a, an important question. Um, from your experience, what do you see as some of the current trends and possibly a preview of what's coming? And perhaps you could even talk about the recent survey done by Citizens, the Citizens Business Resiliency Survey. We'd love to hear about that. Absolutely. So uh, there's a few things. You talk. One of the things that the survey revealed to us is that resilient customers, that is customers that can, can or small businesses, excuse me, uh, small businesses that can withstand sort of uh, turbulence, disruption, et cetera, in the, in the market, they tend to take 25% more payments. So what do I mean by that? So different types, not necessarily the volume, that's obvious, but I've got more options available to my customers as a business owner. So I can take different forms of, of payment. So I can take ACH, I can take credit card, I can take um, uh, uh, Venmo, PayPal, um, uh, ex, et cetera, et cetera. So that is really, really critical. The other thing I would say is that companies, small business owners that really focus on cash flow 
uh, tend to be much more resilient. So on average, 82% of small business failures can be traced to a lack of cash flow management. So resiliency, we know in a recession, customers with more liquidity, business owners with more liquidity, um, stronger balance sheets tend to not just survive the recession, they tend on average to come out of the recession in a stronger position and wind up doing significantly better than their peers because they're able to take advantage of opportunities that may come their way as a result of an economic downturn. So really focusing on cash flow with the idea of, of building uh, liquidity and, and balance sheet, I think are critical. Kate, if you have anything to add. Yes, Kate. Yeah. Um, well, in, in addition to what Mark was talking about, I think more macro trends that we're going to be seeing coming in the future are probably much more adoption and usage of RTP, which is a new payment clearing network that was just um, five years ago created. So it was the first time in probably four decades we, we have a new payment method um, to add to check, wire, ACH, and credit card. So RTP is just, you know, getting started it's a 24-7, 365 immediate payment. The receiver of the payment has it in their account within seconds, even if it's a holiday, even if it's 3 a.m. Um, so that's going to, that'll start to change. It takes a while for systems and like business processes to, to adapt to new options. But I think we'll definitely be seeing that. And now with FedNow that just went live, which is kind of an alternative to RTP, but similar concept. Um, we're going to be seeing more real-time payments uh, enter the, the ecosystem of payments. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more um, consolidation in the market, especially bringing banks and fintechs and software all together so that customers and businesses are able to do what they do without having to go somewhere else for their financial services. They, their, their system that they're using all day long will just have their financial services in there. If they're banking with citizens, citizens will be in their business software. It won't be a separate thing that they have to go deal with. So I think we're that's very much starting to happen. It'll keep happening. And I think the idea is just simplicity, easy, um, bundling things so that you don't have to deal with 10 different places to go get something done. I go here for my invoice. I go here to do the payment piece of it. Then I have to update this system. That'll start coming together. It already is in many cases. And I think we'll see much more of that, um, which which will be beneficial to, to all of us, I think, in the end. Tonight's show, which is just a, uh, a boon, tremendous value to small businesses, a business of one, and of course, a business of many, to major corporations, all who can benefit from the services offered by Citizens. Citizens is one of the nation's oldest and largest financial institutions with approximately $223 billion in assets as of June 30th, 2023. Uh, my co-host tonight... In the studio, Mike McIntyre. Mike McIntyre, who do we have coming up now? It's uh, great to have you here, and I'd like to welcome to the to the show tonight Tom Gretsch, President and CEO of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Tom, welcome. Good to see you. Hello, and, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm grateful. Okay. Tom, quickly, how, how, how are your members doing, and uh, how is the Chamber supporting them these days? Um, it's kind of a one-two punch. Um, we kind of got through the COVID, and as an example, we have uh, 6,000 restaurants in Queens before the COVID. We lost 1,000. Um, and most of those are not coming back, but in its place, due to the resiliency of our um, great immigrant population and, and hard chargers out there, uh, as well as the entrepreneurial spirit, I have been doing more ribbon cuttings across the borough in the last six months or so than I think we've ever done before. So uh, things were bad, got really, really bad, uh, a little, much, much better based upon you know, the general economic situation. But again, we got things like inflation and government uncertainty and, and onerous rules and regulations that are really, really tough in any environment, but especially tough right now in Queens. But we're uh, we're showing our resilience. And how, are, and how are your members doing? How is the chamber supporting them these days? So during the course of the COVID, we were very, very lucky and blessed. Uh, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times, as they say, right? So we were able to get grants and through the generosity of the Stephen Alex Cohen Foundation, they gave $17.5 million dollars to a number of different organizations in Queens County. I was lucky and blessed to be amongst one of them and we gave out the most money. I was uh, uh, Santa Claus for about four months um, during the worst part of COVID giving out uh, unrestricted grants. And so 
We did a lot of work in that area. Uh, another thing that we did was we didn't really worry about whether or not you were a member of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. We've been around since 1911. And I kind of felt, I went to my board and I made this request, we're going to serve everybody, not just our members. And uh, members kept paying their dues for the most part. But at the end of the day, we served everybody. We also got um, a significant funding. We're ready to roll out um, on August 17th, um, a, a press conference regarding some funds we got from Congresswoman Grace Meng to help out um, some of the local community in her district with not only financial advice and HR advice, but legal advice in five different languages. So we're very, very excited about that program. You know, Tom, we're, we're in an interest rate cycle now where, where rates have risen, particularly in the short term rates uh, at, at a very high pace or clip over the last year, year and a half. What are you hearing from members with regards to how they're dealing with rising interest rates? It's, it's killing their expansion plans. Those, those that wanted to grow and take out a loan or even do a home equity uh, line of credit on properties they may own have been put by the wayside. They're just trying to right now work off of cash uh, and continue to work on getting um, uh, market share in many cases, but actual business expansion that might include a capital request are, are kind of put by the wayside, which, you know, for the banking segment is not good news. We're speaking with Tom Gretsch, president and CEO of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Tom, as we, as we close out the segment here, um, you know, you've been known as one of those folks that can uh, think out of the box and, and often does. Um, you've been quite successful at the Queen's Night Markets. Describe that for us. So we support uh, John Wang and, and company over there with uh, a promotion and advertisement. We've not actually been on site, although I know many of my members and some of our staff go there. But we're doing a lot of different work in the restaurant space. And one of the things that we're doing is a uh, is a kitchen incubator that we're, uh, we're working with a developer on in Western Queens that we're very excited about. If I learned one thing out of this COVID situation is that the people that serve and work in restaurants um, were, were woefully uh, unprepared and also not looked after very well. So we're making it our business now. You know, as you, everybody knows, whether you live in, in Sheboygan or Peoria or whatever, but in a place like Queens, the ethnicity of our restaurants, the ethnicity of our people defines neighborhoods. When a restaurant closes, it brings a whole cultural segment is ripped out of their heart and the fabric of the community. So we're making sure across the board that we help and support our small businesses. It's a big part of the reason that we jumped in and saved Nears Tavern. It's a big part of the reason that we jumped in and saved Friends Tavern. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity to let these small businesses shine, and we're happy to continue that trend. You know, it's so refreshing to hear from someone who's on the front lines. Thomas Gretsch, president and CEO at the cha- at the Queen's Chamber of Commerce here on tonight's business banking update brought to you by Citizens. Uh, my co-host, Mike McIntyre of Citizens, is going to now feature and have a couple of key questions from the front lines Speaking with Abe Schlisselfeld, Senior Managing Director at CBiz, Mark Panath. Abe, great to have you here and, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark and Yislev. It's great to be here and I look forward to the conversation. Great. Abe, you know, we're in a rate cycle now where, where rates have come up substantially over the last two years. How is rising rates impacting a, a borrower's ability to borrow money? But more importantly, how is it impacting folks' ability to borrow and refinance? Right. No, it's a great question. It's, it's something that... Uh, we're, we're speaking to our clients and uh, our network of colleagues uh, on a daily basis, if not an hourly basis. Um, the amount that in- interest rates have gone up over the last you know, few months or so um, is really changing the, the landscape of investing in real estate. There are many operators out there that the last time interest rates were this high, um, I'm not even sure if they were in elementary school. And uh, they haven't been faced with uh, uh, this, this kind of an environment. Uh, but if you plan the right way, it's uh, you, you can you can definitely manage around it. Um, and what do I mean by that? So you know, I'll, I'll, cer- certain buildings or investments were made um, modeling out using extremely low interest rates. Let's use two two to three percent. Um, so obviously, when you get into an environment now where um, you know some of the loans that were you know done four or five years ago, they're coming up on the on, on the on the term of uh, resetting the rate. Um, they're in for a shocker. 
But if you have the right uh, uh, financial modeling in place and uh, if you have the ability to pay down some of the principal um, and model out uh, the next few years appropriately, um, you can really come out of it. I'll use the words relatively unscathed, assuming that your LTV um, uh, originally wasn't at an extremely high number. Um, if your loan to value uh, was at a high number and now you're faced with um, perhaps a lower rent roll uh, than you did a few years ago. Um, there will be some challenges, and you know you can still try to work it in with some bringing in some uh, some new investors, new outside money. Um, but there's no question that um, the the uh, increase in interest rates, and quite frankly, probably will still be going up a little bit, um, uh, is having an impact. You know that being said, there's all different types of asset classes. You know, everyone um, talks about real estate as, you know, one type of investment. But there's there are certain asset classes. Um, I'll use um, uh, multifamily in certain geographic areas. You know, talk about, you know, down south and, you know, Texas, Midwest, et cetera. Um, some of those uh, asset classes have actually been doing pretty well. Um, and, uh, you know, due to COVID, people can travel more, um, uh, work remotely, and uh, they, they've benefited from that. Um, uh, so, and, and, and in addition to that, because of the high interest rates, a lot of people aren't buying houses, they're now renting. So there are a lot of factors into, to, into different asset classes. Industrial is, you know, still doing pretty well. So, um, you know, the, the main focus, and it's obviously the largest numbers, um, is on the office space. Um, and obviously, office space is, is having, uh, you know, some challenges now. Um, but, uh, you know, a, as we start getting into more of a, I'll use the new normal. Um, I can't believe we've been saying that for a few years. But, you know, as we start getting more acclimated to the new normal and people start mo modeling out their deals using these higher interest rates, um, you know, things will work out. But there definitely will be some headwinds and challenges over the next, you know, three to 18 months as a lot of these uh, loans come due. You know, you were discussing uh, different types of, of, of asset classes a moment ago. You know, there's essentially really three different types of lending that, that banks do. We typically have commercial real estate financing, uh, fixed asset financing, and receivables and inventory financing. Can, can you di just kind of distinguish between those types of lending and how your firm and how customers should look at that in these days? Yep. So, so real estate financing, uh, which is... Um, something that I deal with a lot more than the other ones is, you know, the conventional, uh, you know, we all know it's, uh, you know, there are people that own their own homes and go out for financing. And then there are those that, you know, buy investment properties, um, again, whether they're office buildings, industrial, commercial, hospitality, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, and, and, you know, you go out, you get, you get the financing and uh, general, generally speaking, and there's uh, a lot of different ways to do it, but generally speaking, um, the asset is basically is what is securitizing the loan from the bank. Um, and, uh, you know, you, the, the bank needs to make sure that the value of the, of the asset is sufficient to cover the debt. Um, uh, and I'll get to the other two in a second, but, but, but the concept of, of the asset, the value of the asset being enough to cover the debt is, is, uh, is an important one. As a lot of the loans are coming due now, um, there have been a lot of discussions with banks about um, extending because the reality is um, the vast majority of banks, not all banks, but the vast majority of banks um, are, are, are willing to wait a little bit more to see what happens with values before they start taking over buildings. Um, they're generally in the business of banking and not in the business of uh, real estate management. Um, so uh, so helps a little bit for the real estate operators that are going through some trouble waters. Um, uh, fixed asset financing uh, is generally in the in the manufa generally in the manufacturing distribution world. Uh, you know, uh, people have plants. Um, and somewhat similar to, to real estate, um, a lot of this equipment to, to pr produce their inventory is is very expensive. And uh, instead of uh, going out, taking money out of your bank account, um, you can get financing for it. And, uh, you know, again, banks are securing the, the loan by uh, attaching uh, a, a lien on, on, the, on, the, on the asset and they're secured um, by the value of that asset. Uh, again, fixed asset financing, generally more expensive than real estate financing because buildings are, generally speaking, easier to sell 
than uh, you know, heavy piece of machinery that may just be specific to a certain industry or uh, even to a certain location, you may not be able to to necessarily move it because these are these are real. We're talking about we're not talking about you know a mixer. We're talking about real heavy uh, pieces of machinery that are uh, you know I would almost equate them to uh, to a, a building, although they're not buildings. Um, and then from inventory and receivables financing, um, it's something that's uh, it's always been around. Some people call it factoring. There's a lot of different uh, terms that are used there. Um, it's been getting a lot more popularity over the last uh, year or so as we've been going through some of these uh, uh, economic challenges. And uh, basically, if a company has inventory or receivables and uh, we, you know, you go to the, uh, the bank or factor and uh, you come up with a some sort of a, a rate that they're they're comfortable paying to uh, to ensure the collectability, and uh, so the bank has some has some both risk and upside um, in the collectability of of the inventory and, and the and the receivables. We're talking with Abe Trisselfeld, senior managing director at CBiz, Mark's Paneth. Abe, as we close out the segment, you know, we, we talked a little bit about real estate and uh, rate resetting and 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 the, and the value of, of of transactions these days. You know, what are you seeing out there with regards to new acquisitions? Are you seeing transactions occurring? Are you seeing buying happen these days in the market? Yeah. So you know, increase in interest rates is is changing the landscape. Um, you know, one thing I do want to say and. Uh, you know, I'm coming on here as an accountant. So in addition to obviously all the consulting on the business side that we do with our clients, um, um, we like to, you know, give them tax advice as well. Um, uh, so, uh, and I'm not gonna give a whole course here on taxes and, you know, the new tax law in 2017, but there is one very significant portion of it that as a combination of interest rates going up, as well as a change in the tax law in 2022, um, that has an effect. And and to, to, to put it in the most simplistic uh, sentence, um, your interest expense can be limited um, uh, depending on a lot of other factors uh, uh, in the operations of your business. And while until 22, it wasn't an issue, it was, or it was less of an issue because interest rates were lower um, and also the, the law made it a lot easier to be able to take the full interest expense. Starting, starting in 2022, um, there were a lot more limitations put, put on and uh, there are many uh, real estate operators out there that as uh, interest rates have been going up combined with the change in the tax law uh, have, have not been able to deduct for income tax purposes, um, the full amount of in interest expense they're paying. So um, there's been some headwinds there and th things to think about and how to structure. Uh, what we've been seeing a lot is uh, lenders are very hesitant right now to lend on real estate. Um, they're not sure yet where the cycle is, where it's going, and that's both from the economic value and the interest rates. And it's 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 very hard now to get uh, what I'll call the conventional loans, uh, auto purchases um, that we've been accustomed to uh, over the last bunch of years. Where um, you know after 07, there was a slowdown. Um, but by 09, the banks were ramping it up again. Um, uh, we're sort of seeing a slowdown now. Um, what, what we are seeing is whether it's from the lending institutions um, or, or other uh, groups out there is 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 willing to fund the money, um, but coming in as an equity partner. And, and essentially, they're they're willing to take some of the risk, um, but they want more of the upside than they've been accustomed to getting in the past. And um, you know, there's always that pushing up pull between operators and what does that do to their business model and is it uh, feasible or not? And so it, it's some interesting times uh, while uh, three years ago, four years ago, it was as easy as going to your uh, your local favorite bank, getting the loan uh, on the on the building. Um, now there's a little bit more uh, speaking to multiple institutions um, and negotiating more on what makes sense for both the, the bank as well as the, the operator. Abe Schlisselfeld, Senior Managing Director at CBiz, Mark Spanath. A special thank you for sharing your wisdom, advice, perspective here on the Business Banking Update brought to you by Citizens. For more information, visit citizensbank.com, citizensbank.com. And now we have an update from the front lines. We're going to be joined by John Harmon, Founder, President, and CEO at the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. Mike? John, welcome, and great to have you back on the show. It's been a while, and I'm so glad you're here with us. Just delighted to be here. John, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, a lot's happened in the last couple of years. You know, How is your chamber supporting your member these days? Well, it's always been about advocacy, connecting our members to resources, opportunities, and information 
to contribute to their success. Uh, Mike, you know, when you hear the terms D, E, and I, we really, D and I, D and the I is about the engagement, but the conversation for us is about transformation, um, pushing back on perceptions. That's how we get it done, um, either electronically or uh, an in-person event, uh, just, you know, pressing flesh and, and, and forging the conversation. You know, John, we, we're in an interest rate cycle now where rates have mm-hmm. gone up quite substantially, particularly on, on, on short-term borrowing or overnight borrowing uh, over the last few years. Uh, how, how have rising rates impacted your members' uh, ability to borrow and, and how are they reacting to these rates these days? I, it's, had, it's, had a, it's having a chilling effect. So, Mike, you know that one of the cornerstones of creating wealth is home ownership. And 35 to 37 percent of blacks in New Jersey own homes. And typically the equity from the home is what you use to start a business. And so the, the cost of borrowing is, is really stymied some of the plans for growth and expansion. And then you um, uh, make that even worse when you, you're struggling to get opportunities. I think if, if businesses can get access to more opportunities, the capital is easier to find. It's just a matter of cost and rising interest rates and you have uh, minimal disposable income. It's a real it's a real challenge for households as well as small businesses. And, you know, as, as, as you think about your members and, and, and their borrowing, you know, we've had chats this evening with other guests talking about real estate and, and, and the impact of, of acquiring new buildings or, or refinancing uh, existing debt. Uh, what kind of education uh, can your members receive from your chamber? Well, the great thing is we have a relationship with citizens and, and your willingness to participate with us on financial literacy discussions on discussions about home ownerships and, and also how to navigate um, having a good relationship with a bank. I think that's key. And having relationships with you and folks like you make it a lot easier for, for small businesses and or individuals to get in a better place in life. You, you get an opportunity and then have to ramp up to get your financials um, to a bank and uh, go through that whole orientation. By the time you do that, you've lost the deal. So having a relationship with, with um, citizens has been key and very helpful um, to making it a lot better for our members. Now, John, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here, but my understanding That's is it. that your chamber is going to be expanding to the New York metro market. Uh, could you please talk about that and the uh, your plan for outreach and engagement with the community? Uh, well, yes, um, we established a, an organization called the New York State Black Business Alliance. It'll be a division of the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey, which you know has been around a little north of 16 years. We're just shy of 20 employees. We're an accredited institution. And so what we're looking to do is have um, this kind of a regional approach on both sides of the Hudson. We're not looking to do subtraction in New York. We're looking to have, have addition, addition and work in harmony with uh, other um, organizations that have a similar mission, but moreover, with all sectors of New York. So when you drill down, it's all about numbers. 95% of black businesses in New York State are sole proprietorships. You know, although they have a larger footprint of businesses and notwithstanding standing the policies, like the, uh, the, the the goals of the 30% minority women on goals. And we want to engage in that conversation and help more black people and black businesses in, in partnership with the, uh, the other sectors of society to get the, uh, have a better life. You know, John, as we look to... Uh Close out this segment, and you talk. We're talking this evening with John Harmon, the founder and president and CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce uh, of New Jersey. You know, John, we 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 try to put a show together here, which gives uh, our listeners real time information. You know, real time nuggets of knowledge to really help them grow their their small, mid size, and and growing businesses. You know, as you look at the role of your chamber going forward, you know, what are your two or three priorities? You know, in the year ahead. Well, I, I think introducing our member businesses 
to emerging markets, uh, the wind, um, the maritime, uh, healthcare, technology in general, and to, uh, getting more capital to businesses that are looking to grow and scale. So um, that's kind of where our focus is and will continue to be. But it all starts connecting with those who have the resources, opportunities, and information. And we, we've had uh, a pretty good track record of success sort of giving a return on investment for those who subscribe to the membership of the uh, of the, the, in this case, the respective chambers. <laughs> so, John, you know, we've been talking tonight, um, you know, with with other chambers of commerce presidents, and uh, you know, Tom Gretchen Queens was talking about how uh, his 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 borough has the most diversity in the world. We spent a lot of time talking about restaurants and really, you know, the traditional businesses that make the our communities great. You know, New Jersey is on the cutting edge of, of quite a bit of innovation these days. You know, I'd love to get your thoughts about some of those emerging business segments, business areas that you see in the state and how the chamber is supporting that endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the governor has made, uh, uh, you know, a handful of them the top priority in the state. For example, the whole wind industry um, is big time in New Jersey, maritime. Uh, and, and that's similarly for New York. AI, this whole disruptive nature of chat, GPT, there's opportunities there. And then the film industry, um, positioning businesses to take advantage of that, helping them get a line for capital investment and engaging those who are leading those industries to, to, to articulate to them uh, using metrics and best practices that diversity is the best way to get the the the, uh, the returns that they're desiring. Now, John, if I could just jump in for a second, you touched on something that's so important today's day and age: being mindful of emerging technologies, AI, ChatGPT. What's your advice as running the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey? How important is it for small businesses and businesses of any size to be mindful of the latest technology and to leverage it? Listen, if you're not embracing technology, you're losing. Okay. I I'm a I'm a I'm a pen and pad type person, but they have slowly dragged me into being a little more uh, of leveraging technology. <laughs> I, it's, it's a game changer. It's a disruptor. It's transformational. You cannot be afraid of technology. Um, it's like a good piece of fish. <laughs> you eat the good part and you throw away the bone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was great having you on. And a slew of guests. Wow, we're out of time. What an incredible show brought to you by Citizens. Tonight's show, the Business Banking Update. Wow, we're out of time. Mike, thank you for joining me on the set. It's uh, great to be back. Oh, what an incredible show. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any of the entities they represent. Citizens does not endorse or sponsor other products and services mentioned. Citizens, for deposit products, member FDIC. Well, we're out of time. Tune in again next Sunday night for another great edition of Mind Your Business right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. Have a successful week. Thank you for watching and make sure to subscribe to this channel and be notified every single time a new video goes live. Don't miss out on any of the weekly interviews that I have with top business leaders, sometimes Fortune 500 executives. Hit subscribe and turn on notifications.